So welcome back from the break. Hopefully you took the opportunity to go and get a drink or go to the bathroom or whatever, get a uh, breath of fresh air before you come back to look at this section. So let's take a look at these concept check questions and then we will start talking about mammals. So describe three key amniote adaptations for life on dry land. Well, the first is obviously the amniotic egg, which allows for reproduction in the absence of water by maintaining a fluid environment um, inside the amniotic sac to allow for em embryological development. Uh, second could be a water impervious skin to prevent drying out. And a third that you could throw in there is um, the use of the rib cage for um, inflating the body cavity so that you can inflate the lungs to breathe more effectively and more efficiently. Those would be three good adaptations that you could list there. Why are snakes considered to be tetrapods? Because they are descended from a common ancestor with lizards that had legs, but dispensed with them. And as I pointed out when we we're talking about the snakes, um, Amongst the constrictor snakes, those that are considered to be the more primitive of the snakes, there are vestiges of the limb bones, of, of the hind limb bones at least, um, within the body of the constricting snakes. So they are tetrapods, even though they have dispensed with the limbs. This is a derived trait um, or a secondary trait as a consequence of adaptation to the snake lifestyle. Describe four avian adaptations for flight. There's a long list of these that you could you could put in here. So a beak instead of a jaw with teeth, um, feathers, hollow bones. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, <coughs> well, uh, <coughs> I think I've I've got past that. Ah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, let's see. Um, uh, single ovary, no urinary bladder. Think about all of the things that we were talking about just a little while ago. Any one of the, any any combination of those, any combination of four of those would work um, if you were asked to provide that sort of information. Remember, all of these adaptations are for one thing, or repositioning of the of the breast muscles. Um, the enlarged sternum, um, the presence of the wishbone, which they actually get from their dinosaur uh, cousins, uh, the Saurician dinosaurs, and particularly the theropods actually have a wishbone-like structure that the birds um, in also have as a member of that lineage. So um, there are a number of different things that you could you could put in here, but remember that all of them are geared towards allowing birds to fly. That's the whole point of those adaptations. Anyway, onwards and upwards, we are about to start talking about mammals. The other line of animals that come from the common ancestor of all modern day terrestrial tetrapods. So mammals are obviously named after the mammary glands that are found in the females. Mammary glands come in many different forms as you will uh, recognize as we talk about the monotremes and the marsupials as the basal members of the mammals. And then as we move on into the eutherian mammals or placental mammals as we um, more commonly refer to them. So not only are mammary glands considered to be derived um, traits and characteristic traits of all mammals, hair is another one. Remember hair, along with feathers and scales, are formed out of keratin. They are all secreted by skin glands. And it's the genetic programming of the glands and the type of keratin that those glands produce that give rise to the three different types of keratin based body coverings. So scales for reptiles, feathers for birds, hair for mammals. 
And in the case of mammals, hair is considered to be diagnostic. Then mammals in terms of the size of the brain compared to the um, rest of the body have a larger brain. This is again considered to be diagnostic. And then something that you may not have recognized is the fact that mammals and only mammals have different types of teeth in their jaws. So if you look at a, a reptile, let's go back and actually maybe I should look at the, at, yeah, that diagram's not going to do it. So I'll do it here. Um, So reptiles have a single type of tooth. So what do I mean by that? Um, if it's a carnivore, They have peg-like teeth, herbivores have flat grinding teeth. So if you come across the jaw of a reptile, you can tell what sort of diet it, it has by looking at the type of teeth. And it only has one type of tooth and all the teeth in the jaw have that form. So if it's a carnivore, all the teeth are peg-like. If it's a herbivore, then they're all flat grinding teeth. In mammals, for those of you who are interested in dentistry and uh, might be considering going to dental school, this is something that you will learn. We have incisors. So those are the large um, flat teeth at the front that are used for pinching off and you bite things off with them. You have the incisors. Then you have pre-canines and canines. These are the longer pointy teeth that you use for gripping and tearing. And then you have premolars. and molars, which have a flat horizontal surface for grinding. And those are the teeth at the back of the jaw that are predominantly for grinding up material that you've either snipped off with your incisors or torn off with your canines. And now you need to break it up into smaller particles. So you're grind, going to grind it up with your molars and premolars. And all mammals have some variation on this combination of teeth. So when you look at rodents, for instance, they have large incisors because they are herbivores and they specialize in eating grass and leaves and things like that. So they need teeth that can slice those up and then process them with molars at the back of the teeth. They don't need um, enlarged canines, so they don't have large canines, they have very small canines. But if you look at something like a dog that is a carnivore, do they have molars? Sure, they need to be able to grind up food. Do they have incisors? Yes, but they have very impressive canine teeth. And those canine teeth are used for gripping and tearing because they are carnivores. They need to be able to grip and tear meat off the muscle of a carcass. So we, we see that sort of situation. So differentiated teeth is a hallmark of mammals and you can very easily tell whether you're looking at the jawbone of a reptile or a mammal if you see because if you see a single type of tooth it's a reptile if you see different types of teeth um, particularly all three forms then you know you're looking at a mammal. In terms of the origin of mammals what uh, it has not necessarily been terribly obvious to many people is the fact that mammals were around pretty much for as long as there were dinosaurs. In fact, mammals lived throughout the age of the dinosaurs, throughout, throughout the Mesozoic. The earliest mammals um, 
that we can identify as, as true mammals appear um, in the early Jurassic, but the ancestors of mammals, the synapsids and the cynodonts appear in the fossil record mid to late Triassic, um, and we start to see um, the appearance of the very first organisms that we would describe as early mammals around the beginning of the Jurassic. And one of the characteristics that all mammals have that we can see um, in looking at the jaws of synapsids and cynodonts and mammals is a reorientation of the jaw structure. So here you see a typical jaw of a synapsid. The lower jaw is made up of two bones. And then the jaw joint is made up of these two little bones known as the articular and the quadrate. If you take a look at a cynodont, what you notice is that the lower jawbone, this particular jaw, uh, jawbone known as the dentary, starts to elongate. And this hind bone starts to shorten. As it does so, the articular and the quadrate um, start to reconnect and form the lower jaw bone or the jaw joint with this elongating lower jaw bone. Eventually, a process on the lower jaw bone enlarges and comes in contact with the upper jaw and forms a totally re engineered jaw joint that no longer requires the articular and the quadrate. So they are no longer necessary to form a jaw structure. Throughout this process of elongating the lower jaw, jaw joint and, or jawbone and re-engineering the jaw joint between the upper and lower jaw, we also see a reduction in size of the articular and the quadrate, and also a, a decrease in the size of the temporal fenestra this opening through which muscles that are attached to the lower jaw attach themselves to the back of the skull. This um, also decreases in size and the um, <clears throat> surrounding bone of the squamosal actually enlarges and provides a stronger um, bone as part of the re-engineering of the joint between the upper and lower jaw. And so the orientation of the muscles that drive the lower jaw change. And if you put your hands up here on the side of your jaw, you can actually feel the muscles and the muscle actually comes up from the lower jaw, um, passes through the temporal fenestra and attaches to the back of your skull. Now, if you look at ape skulls, you find that these openings are much larger and the crest on the top of the skull to which the the, the muscles that drive the lower jaw are attached is quite large, but nowhere near as large as you might expect to see in some of these synapsids and cynodonts because of the, engi the engineering layout of the jaw joint. With the reduction in size and then the loss of um, function in terms of the lower of the jaw joint, these bones can now be adapted to a new purpose and the adaptation is for them to migrate upwards and inwards into the inner ear to connect with an existing bone called the stapes that all reptiles possess that connects the eardrum to the inner ear and specifically to the cochlea that turns the vibrational energy of sound waves into electrical energy in nerves. Because of the absence of any flexibility in the stapes, reptiles are really good at hearing low pitch sounds, but cannot hear high pitch sounds. This is the reason why reptiles disappear when you walk near them, because they can sense you walking very low pitch sound, and they typically leave the area before you get anywhere near them. Because reptiles in general, and I know this is, this is not a particularly popular idea in some circles, that reptiles really don't want to have anything to do with, with humans. Um, snakes as predators would prefer to leave you alone and would prefer not to have anything to do with you. 
They don't view you as a source of food. And so predators typically do not attack anything that is not a food source because the first rule of predation is first, don't get injured. And so there's no point in attacking something that's not a food source and run the risk of getting injured. Nor do you want to invest a very um, useful tool, your fangs and your venom, in envenomating something that you're not planning on eating. And so the only reason why people typically get bitten by snakes is because the snakes feel threatened. When you consider it from their viewpoint, they're on the ground, you're quite large, and you, you're threatening to step on them, they're going to try and protect themselves. Many snakes will move out of the way, but some snakes are genetically programmed to freeze in place. And these are the snakes that present the greatest danger to humans because you may step on them, you may disrupt them, they may feel threatened because they're freezing in place, they're not going to move out of the way, so they strike and you get bit. But that's because they can detect you coming. Their um, oral system, their um, hearing system, responds very nicely to low pitch sounds. With the insertion of these new little bones, the articulate and the quadrate, which become known as the malleus and the incus, you now have a very flexible link between the eardrum and the cochlea because you've got two extra joints in there. Well, you've got two joints in there that didn't exist. This allows the eardrum to, to vibrate at much higher frequencies and for the transmission of those higher um, frequency vibrations to be then transmitted to the inner ear to be then passed on as electrical signals to the brain. So mammals in general can hear much higher um, pitch sounds than reptiles can because we've repurposed the malleus and the incus, what in common language are known as the hammer, the anvil and the stirrup on the basis of their shape. Um, they allow us to hear high pitched sounds because of the ability for the eardrum to, to vibrate at much higher frequencies. So this is part of the re-engineering of the skull and a consequence of the re-engineering of the jaw joint between the lower jaw and the upper jaw. And we see this progressive um, re repurposing uh, or re-engineering of the joint in fossils of synapsids, early synapsids, uh, late synapsids, early synodonts, synodonts, late synodonts. And real late synodonts basically have a jaw structure very similar to, to mammals. Um, and interestingly enough, there is a little um, marsupial critter that uh, in the embryo, this reorientation of the jaw joint and repurposing of the articulate and quadrate plays out during embryological development. Um, and again, if we were in lab, I would show you um, a video that includes um, an interview with a scientist who is actually looking at this embryo embryological development and has specimens of embryos at different um, time points during development that shows the actual migration of the articulate and quadrate from a position adjacent to the lower jaw and the lower jaw joint up into the inner ear to come together with the, the stapes to form the inner ear connection between the eardrum and the cochlea. And this plays out through the development of, of the embryo of this little um, opossum. It's not the opossum that we're familiar with here in North America, it's a related species. Um, and during its embryological development, it actually plays out um, in miniature what probably took many millions of years to play out during the evolution of the synapsids through the synodonts to the mammals and the re-engineering of the um, lower jaw and the repurposing of the bones that used to be part of the lower jaw into being parts of the inner ear. So when we look at the modern um, lineages of mammals, 
wild mammals are present throughout the Jurassic and the Cretaceous and live side by side with the dinosaurs. They are largely nocturnal. They are largely small. Um, the largest mammal of this, time, of this time period was probably no larger than a large house cat. Um, they lived in burrows. Um, and they specialized in hunting down insects at night. And there's a real obvious reason why they, they took on this, this lifestyle, because they could not compete with the dinosaurs. And in fact, if they came out during the day and were out hunting during the day, they would probably become a meal for a dinosaur. And so to protect themselves, they lived in the burrows, came out at night and hunted insects. And it's because of this that mammals have the brain structure that they have with the ability to process um, vision, to process hearing, because those are senses that are very, very useful at night. And because they came out at night and, were con and basically had to hunt at night, they evolved very, very um, sensitive um, hearing and vision as a consequence. So trying to protect yourself from dinosaurs um, actually turned out to be a benefit for our early mammal ancestors because it led to the development of the brain structure and particularly the highly developed visual and hearing senses that we possess as mammals. So let's take a look at the um, three lines of extant mammals. So the most basal group of mammals are the monotremes. These are egg-laying mammals. Um, the eggs have a leathery shell, very reminiscent of reptiles, but they have, uh, the females have mammary glands, but they're not the mammary glands that you would be familiar with. These are glands that secrete milk directly to the surface of the skin. Um, and the young lap the milk directly off the skin of the mother. The hair um, in the case of the three species of echidnas that exist are uh, fused together to form spines. Um, and the fur for the one species of platypus um, is a very fine um, hair that traps air to provide protection against um, heat loss while swimming in freshwater streams. Um, what, me, my, what people may not realize is that um, the platypus also has a poisonous spur on the, on the hind foot of the males, and these can leave very nasty wounds if a human should get um, envenomated by a male platypus. Male, the platypus also has a very sensitive um, duck-like beak. It has a lot of nerve endings in it to allow it to detect the electrical activity of um, contracting muscle, uh, muscles in the um, prey that it chases down. So it eats worms and small crustaceans and so forth that live in the freshwater streams. It keeps its eyes closed while it's underwater. So it's basically feeling around using its bill to uh, find its way through the water. It also lives in burrows in the um, stream banks. The, it usually has two entrances, an underwater entrance and another entrance at some distance from the stream, um, hidden in the um, litter and the fallen tree branches and so forth, so that they can escape if, if they get um, attacked by a predator coming in either direction, either from the water or coming from land. They have means of escape of getting out of their burrow. So here's one of the species of echidnas. Um, and these spines, as I said, are formed by fused hair. Echidnas um, eat termites and ants, and they have very large claws on both their hind forelegs and hind legs. They use their four legs for ripping open the termites nest. And then they have a long sticky tongue that they can extend into the nest to, to lap up um, termites and bring them back into their snout. If they are threatened, they use the sharp, the, the long claws on their, 
on all four legs to dig into the ground and they dig straight down so that all that is left is the spine sticking out of the ground and they can dig much faster than you can dig with a shovel. So they can, and then they can use their claws to dig into the ground so that if you try to pull them out of the ground, the claws are anchoring them into the ground. Uh, one of my biochemistry professors when I was an undergraduate student was looking at the hemoglobin of echidnas. And he actually bought an, a pair of echidnas out to my school from the university where he was doing his research. So we got to see these. And we made the mistake of putting one on the ground and it immediately dug itself in. And it took us about half an hour to get it back out of the ground again. And trust me, it took a lot of work to get it out. They are very good at digging in and they're very good at holding their place. They do not want to be dug out and they make you work for it. And then you can see the, this is an echidna's egg and you can see that the young is very, very poorly developed. Um, it has, um, Cursory uh, forelimbs, uh, it does, ha does have hind limb buds, but they're very, very poorly developed. You can see the beginnings of the eye, but the, it's blind at this point. It uses um, its snout or what will become its snout. It has very sens sensitive um, nerve endings on the snout that allows it to find its way to its mother and it finds its way to the glands on the surface of the mother's skin and it starts lapping the milk and the mother will lie there curled up around the, the young, um, allowing them to feed. Then the other basal line of mammals are the marsupials, named for the pouch, otherwise known as the marsupium, that all female uh, marsupials possess. Uh, if the marsupials adopt an upright stance or live above ground, the pouch usually faces forward, so it has an anteriorly facing opening. But if they are burrowing marsupials, they live underground or spend a lot of time underground, the, the pouch has a rearward opening or posteriorly facing opening for obvious reasons. Um, if the opening of the marsupium faced forwards and you were a burrowing mammal, that pouch is going to get filled up with dirt as you burrow your way through the soil. So it faces backwards to protect the young, always known as joeys. So all the young of all marsupials are referred to as joeys, um, irrespective of what type of marsupial you're talking about, at least as far as the Australian marsupials are concerned. So here you can see a young possum so this is a marsupial possum um, out of Australia called a brush tail possum. There are many possums that live in Australia. And you can see what I was referring to in terms of very poorly developed. So instead of being, um, or instead of a shelled egg being laid, the egg is retained within the uterus of the mother but the young is born very, very poorly developed at about the same stage of development that the echidna's young hatches out of the egg. In this case, however, the young follow a, layer, a trail of saliva that the mother links from the um, opening of the birth canal up to the opening of the marsupium. And so using these very, very poorly developed um, Four paws, the um, joey follows the saliva trail up to the marsupium. Then it crawls into the marsupium and crawls around again using the very sensitive nerve endings in the snout to find a teat or a nipple. And it latches on and it may stay latched on there for the next two to three months feeding from feeding on the mother's milk. It goes, it starts. It, or it continues its embryological development then inside the marsupium. Uh, eventually, it reaches a point where it starts to explore the outside world initially for very short periods of time, maybe even initially just by sticking its head out of the marsupium to see what's going on around the outside, but it still returns back into the marsupium to feed. But eventually it gets to the point where it's ready to start um, 
converting over to solid food. So it may start by simply feeding when the mother is feeding. Eventually it will start spending time outside of the pouch, but always returning back to the pouch if it is startled or if it is threatened. Um, ultimately, about six months post birth for most marsupials, the young start to spend most of their time out of the pouch, um, either alongside the mother or clinging to the mother's back, um, depending on the type of marsupials that we're talking about. So this is another type of marsupial. This is called a bilby. This is a carnivorous um, marsupial. Think of it as being somewhat equivalent to a weasel or something like that. It lives underground um, in burrows, but it comes out at night to hunt insects, hence the large ears to hear things, to hear the sounds of the insects that it's hunting in, in in its environment. Um, yeah, before I go on to talk about the next slide, just one thing that um, you may not be aware of is that for many of the marsupials, the females are almost always constantly pregnant. So once she gives birth to one set of joeys, and they, there could be multiple births, not just a single birth, but multiple births, um, she will mate uh, relatively quickly thereafter, even though she's got joeys in the pouch. But the zygote that forms as a result of that mating goes into stasis and does not continue development. It's held in stasis inside the uterus. So long as there is a, at least one joey feeding on a nipple. One Technique that many of the highly mobile marsupials, so the macropods, these are the kangaroos and the wallabies, actually use as a way of escaping from predators is that the females will actually take the joeys out of the pouch and throw them away because they are considered to be a liability. Um, it sounds pretty harsh, but the mother is already pregnant with the next generation of joeys. So if she discards the joey that's in the pouch, she will give birth again very quickly to replace the one that she's just discarded. Um, this means that they are constantly able to keep their numbers up and reproduce fairly quickly, even if they have to discard one generation of joeys to escape from active predators. This came as somewhat of a of a surprise to the biologists that first discovered this, but it's now recognized as a, um, an escapes uh, strategy that a lot of the macropods use to get away from their predators. What is um, important to recognize is that the origin of marsupials. Is in South America. While it was it was connected. To Antarctica. and Australia. So marsupials migrated from there to Australia via Antarctica. There are fossils of marsupials in Antarctica, um, but there are no obviously living marsupials in Antarctica. In fact, the largest animal living in, an, in, in Antarctica is a small insect. Um, but the marsupials 
uh, went extinct in Antarctica when it finally broke away from Australia about 60 million years ago and migrated down to its current position and became the cold um, continent that we recognize today and became essentially devoid of all life. Marsupials continued to thrive in South America for some period of time, but when South America finally linked up to North America through the Isthmus of Panama, um, marsupial, uh, sorry, placental mammals migrated down out of North America where they had originated along with um, Europe and Asia and to some degree Africa. Um, actually was, yeah, it would have been earlier than 12 million years ago. 12 million years ago was when the Isthmus of Panama finally created the permanent connection between North America and South America. But somewhat earlier than that, the earliest placental mammals from North America made the migratory trip down into South America and gave rise to a unique set of placental mammals in South America, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, but in the, in the meantime, the marsupials could not outcompete with the placental mammals. And so they more or less became extinct. There are four species of marsupials still extant in South America. And one species of marsupial actually migrated up the land bridge against the placental mammals migrating down and is still resident in North America today. And you will recognize them as the Virginia opossum. This is a marsupial. It is the only marsupial that is extant to North America. And it is the survivor of a larger diversity of marsupials that occupied particularly South America, but to some degree um, a little bit into North America once land bridges started to form up periodically between North America and South America. But again, they were unable to compete in South America. Um, of course, everyone knows that in Australia, marsupials now dominate and occupy all the available niches with the exception of the few placental mammals that made their way to Australia in company with humans. So the only wild indigenous placental mammal in Australia is the dingo, which is a descendant of the semi-domesticated dogs that came to Australia with the ancestors of the Aborigines, the um, First Nation people of Australia. The other um, placental mammals that are present in Australia were introduced by European settlers at various points in time, much to the detriment of Australian um, marsupials. Um, because some of the imported marsupials like rabbits and cats um, are active predators on the marsupials and because the marsupials did not co um, evolve with them, they have struggled at times to deal with the predation, which is unfortunate, obviously. But in the history of Australia, um, essentially all of the major niches in all of the ecosystems were occupied by, by marsupials. So while we don't see large um, predatory marsupials or carnivorous marsupials, in Australia today, the largest one um, is the Tasmanian devil. Um, there was also what is known as the Tasmanian tiger, but it was a um, large um, marsupial predator about the size of a large dog that was also present in Tasmania when European colonists first arrived, but they essentially hunted it to extinction because it preyed on domestic livestock and the last confirmed Tasmanian tiger died in a zoo in Tasmania in 1938. <clears throat> there have been consistent rumors since then that perhaps in some very isolated areas, there may be still a small population of Tasmanian tigers, but no definitive evidence has ever been produced to um, demonstrate that they actually do exist. However, there is a move afoot by some um, geneticists to try and de-extinct 
the Tasmanian tiger using preserved material that contains the DNA of the Tasmanian tiger to try and um, create um, some living tigers, a Tasmanian tiger is a process known as de-extinction. But in the fossil record, we know that there were marsupial lions um, and other large um, marsupial carnivores, including some pretty impressive saber-toothed um, predators, um, carnivorous giant kangaroos, carnivorous giant wombats, all, all sorts of um, large marsupial predators and herbivores. Um, but we think that many of those likely started to go extinct with the arrival of the earliest humans somewhere around 40,000 years ago. There seems to be a pretty good correlation with the changes in the habitat caused by these early humans, particularly with their use of fire that pushed the large marsupials to extinction and favored the smaller marsupials that could get by on less, um, less food sources, I guess. So here are uh, some examples of some marsupials that are extant in Australia and their placental equivalents in other locations around the world. This is obviously a um, great example of convergent evolution where organisms arrive at similar solutions to similar problems posed by similar habitats um, in different locations. And again, this reinforces the notion that is starting to gain traction in evolutionary biology, that there may be only a limited number of solutions to particular problems. And that while you could hypothesize that any, any possible solution ought to work, there may be some limits placed on the types of solutions that actually can um, work because of the nature of the problem that is trying to be solved. Um, this is a, an area of ongoing research um, in modern evolutionary biology. So Eutherian mammals, the mammals that you and I belong to and the vast majority of mammals that we are familiar with belong to, are defined by the fact that the young are retained within the body of the mother in the uterus and are linked to the mother's blood supply via the placenta that performs um, all of the tasks necessary to supply nutrients and oxygen to the young and also dispose of waste and carbon dioxide from the young. There's no clear indication as to when specifically in the geological record we see the first evidence of eutheriums. Molecular clock data is at odds with um, the fossil record. And so it's not entirely clear as to exactly when in the geological timeline, the earliest eutherians start to evolve. That being said, we do break the eutherians up into five very distinct groupings. And the reason why is because in some situations they evolved in very, very specific regions of the globe. So this group, which is often referred to as the uh, proboscidea, are uh, also referred to as the Afro, oh, let me scrub that and rewrite it. These are referred to as the Afrotheria because their origin is in Africa or what would become Africa. The Xenathra come from South America. Let me erase that and make it weaker. So these come from South America. 
And remember, for much of its existence, South America was a completely independent continent, or at least independent of North America. It may have been linked to um, Australia and, and Antarctica, but those broke away from South America um, about 65 to 70 million years ago, somewhere in that time frame. So for a long period of time, South America was, was independent. So it evolved its own separate forms of Eutherian mammals from um, Eutherian mammals that migrated down from North America and Europe and Asia, a continent called Laura Asia. Um, and so the rodentia um, and the primates come from Laurasia, but specifically the Asian side. And the carnivora, the uh, Perissodactyla, the Cetartiodactyla, um, which includes the cetaceans. So Cetartiodactyla uh, is the um, artiodactyls and the cetaceans as a group. Um, these all come from Laurasia as well, but their origin is what would become North American part, the North American part. So different regions give rise to different groups of Eutherian mammals. And this is why it becomes a little bit confusing as about as to when um, Eutherian mammals first appear in the fossil record and first appear um, as a clearly defined clade from their earliest common ancestors. Uh, because each geographical location that resulted from the breakup of Pangaea um, gives rise to its own um, groups of Eutherian mammals. So we're not going to talk in detail about all of these. What we are going to do, however, is start focusing in on the primates. Why? Because that's where we are. We are a primate and we are going to think in terms of primates and ultimately in terms of apes. So the primates um, include some organisms known as prosimians. So the lemurs and the tarsiers are known as prosimians because the Latin term for monkeys and apes, and of course ourselves, is simians. So the lemurs and the tarsiers are primates that are considered to be basal to the primate clade. Of the two, the tarsiers are considered to be the clade that is more closely related to um, the simians, the monkeys and the apes, and ourselves, of course. So the defining features of primates are a very large brain, even by mammalian standards compared to body size, and a jaw that is much shorter. Um, so if you have a jaw that sticks out, that juts out, it's referred to as a pronathic jaw. It sticks out. Um, what you will find on most primates is the lack of a chin. A chin is actually something that you see in human ancestors, hominins, which we'll talk about in the last section. But as far as hominoids, ape-like, or um, primate um, creatures, there is no chin, but the jaw does jut, jut forwards. And one of the trends that we see over the course of the evolution of primates and particularly the evolution of apes and very specifically the evolution of humans is a shortening of the jaw, very, very particularly seen in a shortening of the lower jaw, but a shortening in the jaw structure overall and the development of a very flat face something that is very typical of um, hominoids and hominins. Um, the eyes are always placed on the front of the face. They are separated by a distance so that you get depth, depth perception. You have stereoscopic vision, which gives you depth possession, uh, perception. Really important because if you are arboreal, meaning you live in trees, 
um, and you're swinging from branch to branch, a process called brachiation, then you need to be able to tell how far the branch is away from you so that you can reach that branch or that you can leap from branch to branch because if you make a mistake, it's a long way down to the ground and there are plenty of predators down there that would only be too happy to use you as a food source if you fall. Um, we also know that primates spend a lot of time caring for their young. It varies from species to species, but typically the young spend a lot of time, comparatively speaking with the parents, um, learning from the parents um, and learning from their peers. And they often spend a lot of time in social groups with a lot of very complex social behavior and interactions going on between individuals within the groups. There are no jaws, uh, sorry, jaws. There are no claws on the digits. Instead, they are replaced by flat nails. That allows the um, appendages to be used for grasping because if you have claws, claws get in the way of grasping, but flat nails now allow for a grasping um, usage for the appendages, both the what we would refer to as hands and feet. And then to emphasize the grasping nature, you have a fully opposable digit in the form of the thumb on the hands and a fully opposable digit in the form of the equivalent on the foot. We call that the big toe, but it becomes an opposable toe on most of the, well, on all of the primates except ourselves. On our foot, our big toe is obviously not opposable, so it can't be used for grasping, but therein lies the story of our own um, evolution. So these are all um, features that are associated with um, defining what is meant by a primate. I'm going to add one more in here. Um, So fingerprints, ridges, digits, So these are, this is a feature that is also found in the vast majority of primates. There are these ridges on the digits and on the um, palms and on the feet of those that have the opposable digits on, the, on their feet. This provides a roughened surface that allows them to grip onto branches and, and um, tree trunks and so forth. If this goes hand in hand with having the opposable thumb or the opposable big toe and the flat nails. The, these are all adaptations for an arboreal existence, a life spent primarily in trees, which is the, where the vast majority of primates live. So when we look at the, the um, lineages of primates, we have the three major groups, the lemurs and the lorises which are, and potos, which are very, very closely related to each other. Lemurs are found um, uniquely in Madagascar. They're in, endemic to Madagascar. And because of human activity in Madagascar, the vast majority of lemurs are now um, under threat of extinction um, because of the loss of their forest habitats. Um, lorises and potos are in better shape um, but again, the intrusion of humans into the um, undeveloped forests is likely to lead to them also being put under threat of extinction. Then you have the Tarsiers of Southeast Asia. Um, 
One unique characteristic of the Tarsiers is that they have extremely large eyes, and this is because they are all exclusively nocturnal. And so having a large eye allows them to see um, very well at night. Amongst the, I believe it's the lorises, um, is an animal called the bush baby. Um, if you Google this, you'll see images of it. It also has extremely large eyes. The eyes occupy a third of the volume of the skull, which clearly tells you that it is um, nocturnal, but it has a unique feature in that it has what looks like a digit. It's actually a very long extended wrist bone that it uses for probing into tree trunks to pull out grubs and other burrowing insects that burrow into the tree trunks. And it does so at night. At night, it also has extremely sensitive hearing so that it he can hear the scritchy, scritchy scraping noises that the insects make as they're burrowing their way through the tree trunks. So these are a couple of examples of um, primates that you can, that have interesting adaptations, but it tells you exactly what they're all about. Then you have the anthropoids, which are the group that includes the monkeys and the hominids, which are the ape-like creatures. So the great apes that we are part of. So this is a um, lemur. I forget which species this is. I ought to know. Um, this one um, does a lot of leaping as a lot of lemurs do. And sometimes you hear the reference to leaping lemurs. Um, many lemurs leap around, they leap from tree trunk to tree trunk, and even when they're walking, they do a lot of leaping, bounce around. When we look for anthropoids, the origin of anthropoids is likely in Asia, which is not surprising considering that the Tarsiers themselves, as ex the extant Tarsiers, are confined to Asia. So we think that um, the origin of anthropoids is probably in Asia and that some of them then migrated westwards and eventually migrated into Africa to give rise to um, the monkeys and the ancestors of modern apes and some of the modern apes then, or some of the early early um, derivative um, apes migrated back to Asia to give rise to um, the Asian apes. There is even a fossil giant ape that is essentially a giant version of the modern day um, orangutan that probably stood around 10 to 11 feet tall. It was huge, even by, by the standards of today's orangutans or the um, gorillas. This was a positively huge ape, but we only have a limited number of fossil remnants. We don't have a full skeleton. So we, we're not entirely sure just how big this was, but we do have the, we, people have extrapolated the size of the animal on the basis of the few parts of the skeleton that we do have. So there's, there is evidence of a wide variety of anthropoids, both monkeys and apes, um, in the fossil record. So here's the um, phylogenetic tree of the primates. Here you have the lemurs, lorises, and bush babies, the tarsiers. Then we have two types of monkeys, new world monkeys and old world monkeys. So new world monkeys are found in South America, old world monkeys are found in Africa. And then you have the apes. And depending on how you talk about the apes, you may have lesser apes and greater apes. So the lesser apes are the gibbons and the greater apes are the orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, and ourselves, and all members of the hominins, the human-like, so members of genus Homo and related species. Sometimes the gibbons are included amongst the great apes. Sometimes they are described as lesser, lesser apes because they are substantially smaller in body size compared to the orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, and ourselves referred to as great apes. So how does South America get its monkeys? Probably because 
in in geological in the geologic past south america was much closer to africa than it is today we know that um, north america and south america are slowly moving westwards and Europe and, and Africa are slowly moving eastwards. They're separating from each other and the point of separation is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And so if we extrapolate backwards in, times, we, in time, we find that um, North America and particularly South America in this instance, remember it is a separate continent at this point in time, is much closer to Africa. And so the distance over which the ancestors of New World monkeys would have to travel is much shorter. And it is suspected that they probably made their way across the very narrow body of water that was the Atlantic at that point in time, probably on rafts of trees that floated out to sea um, from rivers and that sort of thing, perhaps as a product of storm activity, but certainly, um, the body of water that they had to cross was much, much smaller than the, the Atlantic Ocean as it exists today. And even the um, easternmost tip of Brazil is very, very close to Africa compared to the rest of North America and South America and Africa. The distance is substantially less than what you might think. Um, but once they separated from each other, both groups of monkeys went through different evolutionary pathways and there are distinct features that separate the two today. So here you can see some examples of new, a new world monkey in the form of a spider monkey and an old world monkey in the form of the macaque. So new world monkeys are strictly, oops, let's put up the pen again, strictly arboreal. meaning they spend their life in the trees and it's actually very, very difficult to get them to come out of trees. They don't want to come out of trees. You can, in the case of spider monkeys at least, use their appetite against them because they love certain types of fruits. And if you put the fruit on the ground, they will come down and get the fruit off the ground. So that's about the only way that you can entice them to get out of the trees. Because of this, they have a prehensile tail. meaning that the tail can be used as another grasping tool. So these are, the, these are the monkeys that you see hanging by their tail from the tree. If you see that, you know that you're dealing with a prehensile tail and you know you're dealing with a new world monkey. Old world monkeys do not have a prehensile tail. In fact, many old world monkeys don't have tails at all. Think of baboons and things like that. They are monkeys, they don't have tails or they may have a tiny little stub of a tail. And there's a reason for that. So they're strictly arboreal, they have a prehensile tail. And the other thing, and you can see this in the, in the picture, forward facing nostrils. So you can see that the nostrils are right there on the tip of the nose facing forwards. And this is very characteristic of new world monkeys. So what are some features of old world monkeys that make them distinct from new world monkeys? Well, old world monkeys are only semi-arboreal or ground dwelling. So there are some monkeys that actually do not live in trees at all. So if you go to Gibraltar, which is on the southern tip of Spain and is only a few miles um, separated from Africa by the Strait of Gibraltar, the entrance into the Mediterranean, you will find monkeys living in Gibraltar. In fact, they're the only monkeys that live in Europe. And they don't live in trees. They live on the cliffs of the Rock of Gibraltar. And they belong to a um, plate of monkeys that do not have tails. They don't need them because they are strictly ground dwelling. So they're semi-arboreal. Um, 
and ground dwelling, no prehensile tail. or no tail. They have a fleshy pad on their butt to sit on. This is found in many old world monkeys and the nostrils Shift this out of the way. Nostrils face downwards. Just like ours. And there's a reason why ours face downwards, and just like the um, nostrils of an old world monkey because apes um, are descended from a common ancestor with monkeys and they retain this downward facing nostril arrangement and remember we fall within the apes so not surprisingly we also have downward facing nostrils so these are some characteristics that set the, the new world monkeys of, apart from the old world monkeys and so now, when you go to the zoo and you take a look at monkeys, you could you ought to be able to tell their, geolo their geographic origin by looking at these features. You should be able to recognize them. So here are the apes. Um, yeah, so about the same time as New World monkeys are gaining a foothold in South America, the common ancestor of apes and monkeys uh, splits into two populations that will eventually, or out of, out of a common ancestor with monkeys, the um, ancestor of apes appears. Now, you may be familiar with many of these. Uh, <clears throat> the one that you may not be familiar with is the bonobo. Um, that's because for many years it was considered to be a subspecies of chimpanzees, but it is now recognized as being a completely separate species um, that is descended from a common ancestor that it shares with chimpanzees um, that postdates the common ancestor that we share with, with the um, chimpanzee slash bonobo um, common ancestor. So humans as or the lineage that would eventually give rise to humans separated from a common ancestor that is shared with chimpanzees or what would eventually um, evolve into chimpanzees but post that separation there would be another split that would um, give rise to chimpanzees and a separate species the bonobos then we have the gorillas and the orangutans, which most people are familiar with, and the gibbons. So the gibbons and the orangutans are found in Southeast Asia. Chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, and of course our own ancestors are of African origin. So time for another break. Let's check the clock, see how we're going with time. Yeah. Um, so the two concept check questions for this break. And this is the last break leading into the last section. There's one more concept check question at the end of the, of the next section as well. But um, let's take a look at these two. Compare how monotremes, marsupials and eutherians bear their young. So how do they give, how do they give birth to their young? Um, and describe at least five derived traits of primates. We've got more than five um, that we've talked about, but when we come back and look at these, at these questions after the break, we'll talk about um, those traits and we'll talk about the birthing patterns of the monotremes, marsupials, and eutherians. I'll see you on the other side of the break.